So we're going to continue. What I was showing in the last video was finding good image resources. And I found quite a few. I have found ones that are just lines, but look how those lines are kind of thin. I believe that's actually a Shell Silverstein illustration, not a Mercer Mare illustration, but it's from the same era. Shell Silverstein would also be a good one for this. Lighthouse in the Attic, all of that. Sometimes it's fan art of Mercer Mare, but nice high resolution. And then sometimes it's right from my beloved book. Ah, oh, such happy memories. But there's a lot of color and other stuff besides black lines. What I do want to try to avoid are things that are not lines, but solid shapes, right? So there's a difference between line art and like graphic art. Graphic art is done in solid shapes. So if I told you to combine different black logos together, that would be pretty difficult because there's just a lot of big black shapes. And when you layer them on top of each other, they just look like big black shapes. It's okay to have some black, but you want a lot of that line art to carry through. So let's look at some of the inspiration for this project. And I'm going to give you some historical information. And I was kind of surprised. This happened only starting around 2020. Uh, certain students weren't familiar with what collage was. Right? Collage used to be something we would always do in elementary school for projects. You would always do to decorate your locker. It's when you cut up photographs and pieces of paper and kind of scrapbooking and you glue them all together to make an image. So we can think of it as a scrapbook. Collage, if you're interested in art history, has only existed for about 100 years, a little bit longer than 100 years. The first collage work was actually done in the art historical record by Pablo Picasso in something called synthetic cubism, where in order to make an abstract image, Picasso actually combined together like labels from food items and liquor bottles and cardboard boxes and newspapers and used that as his paintings, right? It came after analytic cubism. Then once you get to the run up to World War I and then between World War I and World War II in Europe, uh, photography was more commercially viable and used and people started to tear up and cut up photos and then collage them together. And that actually has its own name in art history. It's called photo montage, right? Now, some of the pioneering photo montage artists, one of my favorites is Hannah Hook, pioneering female artist, who created stuff during the Weimar Republic, uh, critical of the rise of the National Socialist Party, what we call the Nazis, in, in German government in the 1920s and 30s. <clears throat> and some of her works were really about critiquing that, like her most famous piece, this one, cut with the Dada kitchen knife through the last Weimar beer belly cultural epoch in Germany, which is using a combination of newspaper text and photographs from newspapers, all black and white because color reproduction wasn't a viable uh, commercial product in the 1930s. It was far too expensive. And then collaged all together onto a board. Now, what I want you to do is to think how would you make a piece of work like this in traditional reality, right? You would have a big table. You would have to clear that table off, and you would first get a big piece of paper, big blank piece of paper. And then around that paper, you would have all of your different magazines, all of your different newspapers, all of your different photographs. And then you would start cutting those things out, right? And then putting them and gluing them onto your paper. In digital compositing, it's the same process as this kind of historical collage. To bring that process through the ages, a collage took a big turn in the 1950s and 1960s and even inspired the art movement of pop art. And what was interesting about that era of collage is then color printing was something you saw a lot. You have what's called four color offset lithography printing. And he had full color advertising, which is what this uses. And this artist, it's an artist named Jess, used the collage materials as individual brush strokes to create original compositions. What's great about collage, whether it's using photos, whether it's using advertising, whether it's using 
you know, uh, product packaging is that you are creating a wholly new image out of existing materials. It's like if you go to the back of, of Home Depot and you find all of their garbage, right? And then you make a sculpture out of the garbage. <laughs> that sculpture is different than all the parts you found. Now let's look at today's artists. There are still people that do traditional collage. This is an artist named uh, Jesse Treese and post them on Instagram because that's how more people can see them, but we'll call them untitled hand cut collage and sells prints, which is ironic because those are digital prints of handmade collages, right? But that's just because these look just like digital art, but they're all done by hand, cut out of magazines and different found resources. Question. Mm -hmm. If it's close, then it's close. That will work. Yes. So collage or photo montage. This is the traditional version of what we're calling compositing in the digital age. Sometimes they're called paste ups too. Let's look at how they're used. This kind of technique of the line art jumble is used in culture. It's inspired by an artist I like named Arturo Herrera. And I saw Arturo Herrera's work uh, in LA when I was a college student in the 1990s. And he was born in Venezuela. He mostly works out of Chicago. He does show in San Antonio through Art Pace in Ruby City. And what his work, especially his early work that I fell in love with, mostly consists of, like this one from 2004, it's painted cut paper on board. Uh, it is 23 inches by 16 and a quarter inches, and it is valued between $30,000 and $40,000. So it's it's out of my price range. I don't own any Arturo Herrera work. But I'll show you what I liked about it when I first saw it in LA. I saw a show at the LA Armory of really large murals. I'm just zooming in so you can see it. Uh, but it's in the assignment, that looked like this. So this is actually not cut paper. And I don't know if it's an exact image of it, of the one I saw, but what it was was colored felt that was cut out into line art and then hung on the wall. And this one was about 17 feet tall. But when you see it small, you can kind of recognize where those lines come from. Does anyone recognize where those lines come from? Seven Dwarfs, yes. Walt Disney's first feature-length animated film, the first feature-length animated film ever to be made in the 1930s, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So immediately he was compositing from a source that's very familiar to people. He, he was actually using Disney coloring books, right? And then making his own compositions by cutting and pasting, and then using that as a drawing to make bigger works of. Make sense? What's cool about Arturo Herrera is to my knowledge, he has never been successfully sued by Disney. So that these pieces are his own work product because they don't really look like Disney characters, right? Instead, they're unique compositions made up of components that come from Disney characters. Here's another one of his pieces. This was like red felt cut out. And it's clearly Snow White, and then the, maybe there are some birds here, right? But he subverts the image by doing this kind of abstract expressionist drip line art, covering up very notably the eyes, the face, the silhouette of the hair, all the things that are copyrightable about character design, and turning it into his own image. And then I'm going to show you some past student work, because you might use these skills again in your future careers. So this is by a student named Angela Wally. I give you links to all the artists I show in assignments so you can kind of see. Uh, Mark and Angela were both students of mine. They are in a band called Dreamboard, a San Antonio band. And when they wanted to make t-shirts for their band, they used this method. They did a line drawing of each other. And I don't know if it's Mark's drawings or Angie's drawings, but then they duplicated it in the computer, overlaid it, 
deleted, you know, made it into a line art jumble for their first t-shirt. So you get to arrange these any way you like, but they do not need to be recognizable at the end. What they need to do is be an interesting image to you. So I'm going to show you how we can put all these different high quality references into a file that we can start working on, just like you would bring collage elements and put them around on your big piece of paper. But then it's up to you to kind of cut and arrange them into a shape you think is interesting, whether that's with symmetry or not. I like them best when they're free floating. And you'll see a lot of that where there's nothing overlapping the edge. And I personally like them best when they're like this and they're free floating so that they're interesting if you look at it upside down, right side up, turned on its side. It's just a collection of interesting bobbles and lines because that gives you the most freedom for, for your expression. So I'm a little bit more partial to this approach than to this approach, but both fit the requirements. All right, so we can follow along step by step here in the exercises. This is kind of a nice stand in along with the videos for how to do it if you have to do it at home, but you guys get to keep trying and ask questions right now in class. Always important to come. So we're gonna use this program called Photopea. It's linked right here in the instructions, but you can also just type in I'm going to put it into a new window because this browser is getting a little heavy. You can always just type photopea.com. You are not required to create an account, to log in, to do anything like that. But if you do decide to, you just link it to an email. It's free and they don't send you a lot of stuff, at least not in my experience. And the one advantage of logging in is it will save your current work in its website's memory but that is not a substitute for saving it in two places yourself because website servers who knows but what i'm going to do is go to photop.com i haven't logged in i haven't done anything what i'm going to do is i'm going to open from my computer and to open from my computer i need to go to my desktop and i need to find the image that i like best of those image sources that I found. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six of them. As long as you have five. And I'm going to say that the one I like best is this one. This monster head. Okay. Now that I have that open, we have our first look at what a raster imaging program is. This is a clone of Photoshop. All the functionality we do here, we can also do in Adobe Photoshop. We can work interchangeably between the two. So the first thing I'll notice is in the bottom left-hand corner, if you don't see anything in the bottom left-hand corner, what I want you to do is hit Command R. When you hit Command R, it will turn on your rulers. And your rulers will show you your pixel dimensions. And just like in a Google image search, it will tell me that this image is 1,138 pixels by 1,600 pixels. Now that's all well and good. That's a high quality image, but it is not big enough to be my, my artboard. So remember when we were talking about collage, I think I closed it, but what I need is the artboard. I'll open this one up again. Hannah Hulk. from my native land of Germany. So what I need is to set up this piece of paper that I'm gonna glue all of my pieces to, right? That's what's called the artboard or sometimes called the, the picture space. And it needs to have enough pixels that it can accommodate all of them at high resolution. You are gonna to need to learn this and you will learn it over and over again on assignments. The smallest you are allowed to do a project for this class, exercise or assignment, and still meet requirements, is physical dimensions of 8 by 10 inches at 300 pixels per inch. So what does that mean? Your image needs to be bigger than 1,000 by 1,000 pixels when it's done. It needs